A multimedia journalist by training, Hiba spent one decade reporting from conflict zones in the Middle East, Africa, and Central Asia before moving into management, where, she current, where she's currently the director of the New Humanitarian. Her work for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the Christian Science Monitor, Bloomberg News, and the New Humanitarian, among others, took her to places like Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Chad, and Libya. And she received a grant from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting for her work in Northern Sudan. Hibba has worked with the New Humanitarian in different capacities since 2007, including as field correspondent and Middle East editor, and played a key role in planning and integrating IRIN, the Integrated Regional Information Network's spinoff from the UN to become an independent media organization. Her recent TED talk, titled Stop Eating Junk News, drives home the importance of responsible journalism from crisis zones. She's a regular commentator on humanitarian policy in her published work, in governmental briefings, and at conferences around the world. She's a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on the Humanitarian System, and in 2018 was named one of 100 young global leaders under 40. She was also named one of the 100 most influential Africans of 2018 by New African Magazine. Take it away, Hiba. Thank you very much, Malika, for that kind introduction. And it's nice to be here. Um, great to see uh, all of you virtually. Um, a, a brief word about the new humanitarian because it relates to what I'm going to talk about today. Um, as many of you will know, we are a, a nonprofit news organization that reports about humanitarian crises. And we set out to rebrand last year from, um, as Malika mentioned, what was then Iran, and we're uh, trying to decide on a name. And what we, the reason we came up finally with the new humanitarian, and, and just a little anecdote, it was actually the humanitarian along the lines of The Economist, and we decided to add new in there because we wanted to, as the news organization that chronicles crises and the way the world responds to them, to examine what humanitarianism looks like in the modern era on the assumption that the way we do humanitarian action today is not the way it was done 50, 100 years ago. So what should it look like today in an age of kind of messy, political, protracted crises? And I, I obviously come at um, my comments from a humanitarian perspective, but the, these are certainly the same issues across the aid spectrum as far as I'm concerned. Um, and just a disclaimer, which is that I'm not um, a, a kind of uh, original thinker on a lot of what I'm gonna tell you. What I am is a good curator of ideas and we come across a lot of them at the New Humanitarian. So I'm gonna try to share with you um, some of the ideas we've come across uh, especially in recent months, as we um, have been putting together a series called Rethinking Humanitarianism. And because this is such a dense topic, I will drop in links as I go along um, to uh, articles and resources that you can look at to dig a bit deeper into um, some of the elements of what I say. So to start with, here is um, our series on Rethinking Humanitarianism, which uh, you might want to have a look at. So that series um, kind of started in 2020, we set out to, to look at the past and the present and the future of humanitarianism without any idea of how much the world was gonna change in the months to follow um, and just how timely uh, a, a discussion that would become. This year is our 25th anniversary. So we have been reporting about crises for 25 years and we thought, okay, good time to look back on how crises have, have evolved in the last quarter century whether aid has delivered on its promise and what lessons could be drawn for the future. And then a global pandemic struck the entire world and overwhelmed healthcare systems, even in developed countries, dramatically challenged the way aid is delivered on so many levels, um, hit funding models hard, uh, and led to a whole bunch of operational complexities um, that you will all be very well aware of. And of course, if that wasn't enough, uh, the resurgent Black Lives Matter movement um, 
in the wake of uh, killing of unarmed black men in the US has led to another moment of reckoning for the sector in which we've seen humanitarians asking themselves, you know, to what extent are we equipped to relieve suffering in the West? Does racism exist within the humanitarian aid sector? Um, and perhaps more fundamentally, to what extent is the sector part of or even propping up a world order that for many is designed to keep power and resources in the hands of, of some people, some countries, while keeping other people and countries poor and powerless. So suddenly, um, our kind of 25 year anniversary project took on a life of its own and became an urgent priority. And I've been speaking about these questions of, of power and humility in aid for quite some time. Um, and there was always a fair bit of interest, but uh, often very little concrete action. And I think in the wake of COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter, suddenly everyone understands why change is not only necessary, but inevitable. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how I see that inevitability, and then hopefully a few ideas for starting points um, in that transition or in that transformation. It's going to be quite a lot of ideas coming at you at once, so I apologize in advance, but my brain just likes to fart things up. So, um, as I see it, both COVID-19 and, and the Black Lives Matter movement have identified or or re-exposed um, the structural problems at the heart of the aid endeavor. Operationally, financially, and ethically, the current model has really just reached its limits. So I'll take those in turn. Operationally, parachuting or surging people into a crisis works when there is one crisis or a few crises at a time. That is not possible when the crisis is everywhere, hitting everyone at the same time. The parachute just isn't big enough, as one person I interviewed once said. Um, and we saw that with COVID, where both the aid industry, but also governments were completely overwhelmed. And we will see it 100 million times worse when climate change picks up speed, because you will have a crisis that engulfs the entire world at a scale in which the sector is just simply not equipped to deal with. Um, and, and so, of course, there's the, the kind of short term operational challenges of COVID and, and what um, what it, I suppose what it means for a sector to be so dependent upon travel and shipping and not really know how to function when those things are disrupted. But then there's that much bigger question of um, whether that model is appropriate when crises become the norm. Financially, early predictions are uh, a sharp drop in uh, overseas development assistance of $25 billion in 2021. Um, including from some of the biggest donors. So that would be 15% of total ODA flows um, in 2018. A survey by Bond, a network of UK charities that you will surely be aware of, found that international NGOs in the UK risked losing one third of their total income because of reductions in individual giving. Um, and so funding is about to go way down just as the needs are about to go way up because of the knock-on effects of the pandemic hunger, uh, livelihoods, access to healthcare, and so on. Um, and so in the short term, this could wipe out NGOs altogether, some of the smaller ones. In the long term, it is bound to force some questions about the business model. And then lastly, ethically, I think the hypocrisies of the system were always, um, were always there, but they are uh, just so on display now that it's hard to avoid. And in particular, white supremacy culture within aid institutions. Um, I think uh, the, the Black Lives Matter movement has um, awakened a whole conversation around racism in aid, and that's absolutely um, a legitimate topic of conversation. And I'm gonna drop in actually a really, really interesting, uh, basically long testimonial that we published um, about what institutional racism looks like in an aid organization. And I'm sorry to, pick on MSF because it has gotten a lot of bad press lately. And that, that, that story is about um, one person's experience of these kind of microaggressions um, for year after year within MSF, but it's obviously a, a sector-wide problem. But it isn't really for me about the racism within organizations. It is much more about the, the way the entire structure is set up, both within the aid world and there it's on, um, on display in the sector's resistance to giving up power to those that it is actually meant to serve and, and why the localization movement has been struggling to get off the ground. But also internationally, in the whole premise that aid is a transfer of wealth, of knowledge, of kindness from developed countries 
um, to developing countries. And we've seen in both COVID-19 and BLM that that notion just does not hold true. The developed world uh, fared much worse in many cases than developing so-called developing countries in the face of COVID. Um, and the most developed country in the world is on the verge of a humanitarian crisis as we're seeing with what it, you know, is approaching uh, civil war in some of, uh, some of the streets of the, of the United States of America. And frankly, if what was happening in the US was happening in any other country, it would be considered a humanitarian crisis, which is an ethnic minority being killed um, in broad daylight by the authorities for um, no crime whatsoever. So, um, so we have a situation in which the kind of fundamental, um, fundamental premise and definitions of humanitarianism are now being questioned. And I wanna quote um, uh, an amazing guy named Uzo Iweala, who's a, a Nigerian American author, and he heads up the Africa Center in New York. And he um, joined an event that we hosted uh, just after um, George Floyd was killed. And uh, I'm going to drop the link in as well to that because it was really just a fascinating conversation about the neo-colonial foundations of aid. And he said, and sorry, I'm just going to ask, I think it might be you, Rachel, um, to mute you if you can. Thank you. Um, and, and he said, the liberal capitalist world order, including international aid institutions that were developed in the post-World War II era, are now charged with helping the world's poor, but that whole system was built on the backs of slaves and slave labor that amounts to at least $16 trillion. And if that was paid back um, at minimum wage, according to, to one estimate. And he said, aid only works if people believe that black people will always be an underclass. Um, sorry, Rachel, I'm gonna ask you again if you don't mind muting. Uh, so aid only works if black people will, are, are seen as an underclass. It's buying into the system to believe that the West or the North will always be on top and that it's money from rich countries going to poor countries when in fact he calls it reparations for the money that was stolen. So I think it's just important to recognize that um, certain countries remain in crisis and poor for a reason. And that is an international order that was set up to be extractive and to privilege certain countries over others. Um, and so that has prompted, as you all know, a, a massive conversation now about how to decolonize aid. Um, and, and I think that starts with, and I'm sorry that all this is so macro and I will try to bring it back down to earth in a second, but that starts with um, a recognition of, of the terms that are used and the definitions that we have become accustomed to and what that says about the biases that we have. And so perhaps instead of calling this whole industry uh, aid, which suggests that there's a strong party that is helping a weak party, perhaps it's time to think about it as solidarity and as everyone helping each other. I think the, the second ethical question for me and maybe it's more of an effectiveness question, um, but it, it equally kind of puts the whole definition of, of aid into question is, um, or at least of humanitarianism. If you look at the, the recent crises, these are challenging um, where humanitarians put their energies and the role that they see for themselves in society. So, you know, right now, what are the threats facing the world? Of course, there is hunger and there is war and so on. But a lot of it comes down to inequality, abuse, predatory economics, um, and, and in, that, in that landscape, an apolitical framing of aid um, is coming into question. So, you know, COVID was in principle a humanitarian crisis, but it really didn't have a humanitarian solution. Um, Black Lives Matter, as I said, was arguably a humanitarian crisis in the U.S., um, and yet humanitarianism wasn't really the answer to, to that crisis either. And today's needs, um, many of them are, you know, justice, social welfare, equality, not um, bags of rice and tarpaulin. And, um, and so if the goal of the whole aid endeavor is to relieve human suffering, there may be more effective ways of doing so in 2020 than the old model um, that everyone has, has become accustomed to. And um, to quote uh, Danny um, Sris Kanaraja, who is the chief executive of Oxfam GB, I heard him at a, at a conference a couple of years ago when he was at Civicus and he said, you know, before the annual reports and the pay scales and the business plans and the bureau bureaucratic processes, 
um, aid workers were passionate, inspired volunteer activists who were connecting and empowering and talking about things like solidarity. That's where the pulsing heart was. So could these crises push international aid into a kind of new life that gets away from a technocratic approach and into um, an approach which, of course, many uh, development NGOs do have as part and parcel of their, of their work, which is solidarity and activism. Um, so I want to pause for a minute. So if, if we say, you know, um, operationally, financially, ethically, the, the current system has kind of reached its limits and reform is necessary, you might say, well, we've been here before. We've talked about reform ad nauseum for decades. Um, is this any different? Will this be in, in the long term kind of a blip in history? And um, and I, I think the difference is that past reforms haven't been asking the right question. They haven't been solving for the right problem. And um, a colleague of mine uh, wrote, and I'll, I'll just keep dropping things in here, but it wrote a, a long um, narrative piece looking at kind of the whole history of the last 25 years of, of humanitarianism and all the different attempts at reform along the way. And, um, and why they hadn't actually led to um, any meaningful change. And it was that they were often uh, technocratic changes. And I think what's different here is that, that this conversation is becoming one about power and justice in a way that it hasn't been, at least in the humanitarian sector in the past. Um, that said, I don't think change uh, is guaranteed. And uh, just that, um, the start of, of the pandemic, I remember in, in the humanitarian sector, everyone was talking about how this was going to be like a transformative moment and there would be a before and after um, COVID-19 in humanitarian action and this was going to be the turning point for localization, it's going to be the turning point for the business model. And in reality, a lot of those transformations have not borne out. That's not to say that this moment won't be transformative, but that it can't be taken for granted and it will take a, a concerted effort to make um, change happen. And, um, and when I actually started kind of delving into some of these questions, you saw, okay, well, actually all of the money for the COVID response has gone to the big UN agencies kind of maintaining the status quo in terms of power dynamics. Or actually when it comes to localization, it hasn't um, actually been that different for many of the local humanitarian aid workers I've spoken to. Um, you know, the, the status quo has more or less carried on as it was before. Um, and so I think, uh, as I say, this is, this is not going to happen on its own. So where do you, what, like, what is the roadmap for the way forward? Um, we've come across a whole range of ideas around different ways of doing things. Um, and so I just share a few with them, a few, a few of them with you. Um, one is to become, for international NGOs, to become the intermediary in the best sense of the term. So um, rather than doing field level delivery, is there a role for international NGOs in advocacy, in fundraising, in um, uh, being the liaison between the international community and the field? Um, can international NGOs be reimagined as a platform for enabling and supporting locally led response? Or to take that a step further, could international NGOs be available to be subcontracted by local NGOs to provide specific expertise? So you as an international NGO have certain technical capacity, um, maybe it's reporting and due diligence, maybe it's specific expertise in water and sanitation. And when a local NGO needs that specific expertise, they call on you and they give you a contract to provide them a service, um, basically flipping the switch from the current modus operandi. Um, a second, well, I suppose third model to think about is uh, what Paul Curian calls a network humanitarianism. And I'll drop in um, a research paper he wrote for that, uh, about that for, for ODI. Um, but in, in the broader societal shift of the network society, the world isn't top down anymore, right? You, people trust their peers, they don't trust the elite. How could aid um, kind of go along with the changes that are happening in society more broadly 
uh, in, in leveraging the network society. So could um, an Airbnb model of aid be possible whereby somebody needs something at a local level, they express their need on a digital platform, and then they have the choice of several service providers um, and they get matched up with the service provider that gives them the best deal and they make the choice of which service provider that is. You can see that each of these is just kind of a, um, a, more, uh, a more dramatic version of the one before. Um, but here again, like we've seen with many other sectors, is there a way of cutting out the intermediary? Um, and empowering the user or the customer to, to take things into their own hands, um, make their own choices and get a more bespoke, tailored response to their needs. And this is already happening. Um, if you look at the networked response to uh, um, the migration crisis in Europe, that was a bunch of volunteers who were basically using this kind of a model. Uh, when I was in, in Syria at the start of the war, it was very similar. There were networked networks of local volunteers who were organizing themselves to fill specific needs. Um, and then one last model I'd like to highlight is a consolidation and mergers. Um, I think it was uh, one of the UK aid officials who said in a speech once that there were 7,000 NGOs um, in the response to the Nepal earthquake in 2015. I would be hard pressed to explain why um, or how 7,000 NGOs could provide very distinct and ad added value over one another. Um, and Simon O'Connell, the former head of, of Mercy Corps UK, uh, was qu quite a prominent advocate of consolidation and merger in um, the aid sector. And he argued that if you, if you looked at any given crisis, so let's say Mosul in Iraq, each NGO is spending, let's say 500,000 US dollars just in their overheads um, to have country directors and security focal points and procurement people. And if you merged all those overhead costs, you could save to his count $1 million per context per year and imagine how that could be reinvested. Um, I think he put out a, a, an open call for anyone who would want to merge with Mercy Corps. I don't think anyone took him up on it. Um, but, you know, these are real practical ideas. I think they sound quite radical. But if I am um, to quote from somebody else, and I don't even know who it is because I just jotted it down in my notebook one day, but um, they said radical ideas start as luxuries, then they become threats, then they become up for debate, and then they become normalized. And so the biggest area that you can change is your own mindset and leaders need to be radical in their leadership because that's, it doesn't start anywhere else. So, so where, where do you start? What does that look like? Um, and, and Danny of Oxfam uh, UK was saying, very interestingly, I think, you don't have to wait for a systemic overhaul to start doing better. There is such a thing as an incremental approach. And, and in the event I mentioned earlier that we did about um, neocolonialism and aid, you know, a lot of the speakers were talking about taking a sledgehammer to all of the um, big institutions like the World Bank and the IMF, and they had to start all over again. And there certainly is, I think, a spirit of revolution among many. But there are also small, simple things you can do that will be better than yesterday. So I'll, I'll share a few of the ideas from uh, Stephanie Kimu, uh, who is a Black international development specialist, specifically on the decolonization of aid. Number one, accept that racism exists. So saying that you're not a racist is not not enough. What are the steps that you are taking to dismantle white supremacy culture? Have an exit strategy. You shouldn't be working in Haiti, she says, um, for 50 years without having any plan of how you're gonna exit. Number three, elevate local expertise. You know, buy the books of, of the local people, invite them to speak, um, honor and, and elevate their rooted expertise in a meaningful way. Um, and, and we have done a whole series of articles about locally led humanitarian response and the frustrations of local aid workers. And I remember one thing that really stuck with me, such a simple thing. They said, give credit to local partners when you write a press release. Like, why are you erasing them from the story when in fact they're the ones doing all the work? Um, and, and finally, she said, understand colonial histories and trauma. Don't go into a country without having read the history and understanding at least how you will be perceived and what um, the experience of the people that you are going to serve may mean for how they perceive you.
So uh, just a few examples on decolonizing aid to, to say there are some starting points. Um, more broadly, look at your people. What is the pipeline for leadership in your organization? Look at your board. Who is on your board? Can you start introducing um, talent that will bring diversity and different perspectives to your team? Um, more broadly than decolonization, I'd say on some of the, the kind of changes that I've described needing to take place, how do you start? Abandon competition and this kind of, um, this obsession with, with staking your ground and, and saving your space. Um, the, in the Netherlands, the, there's this um, outfit called the Dutch Relief Alliance. And basically all of the NGOs in the country were essentially forced by the government to unite under um, this kind of network in which to access government funding, they must together as a group decide in any given crisis who is best placed among them to respond rather than all of the agencies going in, they have to pick two or three that have the greatest added value in that particular crisis. And they do that collectively as a group. And that's just a different way of thinking um, in, in again saying, um, if our goal is to alleviate suffering, what's the best way of doing it and how can we work together to achieve that goal rather than I want to get the most money, I want to be the one known for having um, saved the day in this response. Um, and um, I think one other thing I would point to, and sorry, again, I told you it would be a brain fart, but if, if we look at kind of um, wh where do you start in trying to make these transformations, there was a really interesting um, uh, report written by Paul Knox Clark for LNAP a few years back around how change happens. And he said it's kind of like a football field or a soccer, I'm Canadian, a soccer field, where, you know, wherever the ball is, the whole team kind of runs after it. And he said, identify where there are organic changes taking place at a very small scale and then support them and scale them up. So you don't have to start from scratch, but where are things already happening? And then how can you boost and elevate those changes? So as an example, I'm, I talked about network humanitarianism, which might seem like a crazy kind of sci-fi idea. But then you look at um, the H to H network, which is a humanitarian to humanitarian kind of B to B network of organizations that serve other humanitarian um, organizations rather than people in need. And that's exactly what they are. They are a network. When they go into a crisis, they say, okay, what are the needs here? And it's, um, it's through uh, network kind of um, calling in and out of services that they, that they operate. So these examples do exist and it's just a matter of identifying them and then slowly um, allowing them the space to, to grow. Um, and then I would just say that I think, uh, you know, these are, these are one decision at a time kind of, kind of um, changes, right? Like with every decision you make, you have the potential to make a bit of change. So Oxfam Columbia closed its office after the pandemic, uh, not 100%, but more or less they've moved to remote operations because they realized that they didn't need to have this big physical office and they could actually be um, much closer to the people by just being remote. Uh, Oxfam International has pulled out of 18 countries in, um, in the last few months in a bid to, I, again, partly forced by the financial situation, but partly as a move towards the localization agenda. So, um, you know, you can look at one country at a time, you can look at one decision at a time, how, if that's the kind of end goal, do you get closer to it? Um, just a last word about donors, because Christine had asked me, you know, how do you bring the donors along? Um, and I think COVID is a real opening for that because uh, they have already changed their behavior in so many ways. The, the restrictions that used to be, I mean, you guys will know better than I, um, that used to be seen to be absolutely necessary have suddenly gone out the window and there's all kinds of flexibility now in the way donors are funding um, the COVID response because they have no choice but to do so. And I think that is an opening in saying, well, you were able to do it in this case. Now let's see if you can't do it all the time. Um, were those restrictions necessary in the first place? Um, and, I, and I think it has to be in their interest and you have to make it in their interest, but a, uh, a more local and um, and ethical and less parachute response is going to be uh, cheaper and more effective. So I can't see why it isn't in their interest. Um, I think everyone is really bought into this. It's just a matter of actually doing it, which comes back to the leadership question that I mentioned earlier. So I guess just to, to summarize, 
the, the assumption for most aid organizations is that to grow your impact, you have to grow your size and you have to grow your funding. And I guess my challenge to you is what if you tried testing the hypothesis that with a smaller size and less funding, you could actually maintain or even grow your level of impact. And if that was your goal, how would you go about doing it? So, so often I hear NGOs talking about survival, like we just have to survive, we have to figure out how we can keep existing, everything, you know, our funding is being cut, et cetera, and like hanging on. And what if survival wasn't the goal? What if you were to start with a clean slate and say, in 2020, what is the most effective way to alleviate suffering, whether or not I am part of the answer and be open to what the answer to that question is. 